I've always hated Mondays. This one turned out to be one of the worst for me. My wife, Peggy, was very dull and moody. She made breakfast for the boys and me like a robot. She wasn't nasty, she was just depressed. It didn't help brighten up the morning. I had no idea what caused it and felt no desire to question her. My sons, Robert, 16, and Dave, 18, left for school about the same time I left for work. For the last 15 years, I worked for a transportation company that loaded and unloaded container ships. It was hard work, but it paid good money. I had always dreamed of being at sea, and this was as close as I could get. I dreamed of sailing all over the world and seeing different lands and people. It was in my blood, and sometimes I would get depressed at the realization that it would never happen. Home and family seemed to come first. I was happy in my home life. I had two wonderful sons and a loving wife whom I adored. Unfortunately, Monday came around. What I hated most about my job was the people I worked with. Colin Farrell was the most obnoxious guy in the world, and he had three buddies who were always hanging around, Bob Timbers, Ray Collins, and Freddie Springer. The five of us went to high school together, and I didn't like them then or now. Hey, Grady, missed you at the party Saturday night. It looked like Colin was going to start something early tonight. Saturday night was a company party. The guys and I were supposed to go to Chester to help my dad move out of his house. My mother had died six months ago, and my father had decided to move to a smaller house. Peggy was disappointed, so I told her to go to the party without us. When we got back Sunday night, I asked her how the party went, and she just said fine. I just looked at Colin and didn't say anything. We're sorry you couldn't make it, Grady, but thanks for letting your wife come. She made the whole evening worthwhile. I clenched my fists, listening to his group of hyenas giggling like girls. They seemed to be making jokes at my expense. As I started to walk away, Colin followed me and continued his taunts. She's turned into a beautiful girl since her high school days, Grady. You're lucky to be able to come home with her every night. I realized it was going to be a long day. The veins on my forehead began to show through, and I felt the tendons in my neck tense up. All my life, I'd had to struggle to control my temper. I tried to walk away again. I turned to face the group, and Colin held something out to me. It was red, soft, and squishy panties. Peggy forgot these on Saturday. She might need them to go with that red bra she was wearing. The whole group broke into laughter. I stood looking at them without raising my head. The red silk fell to the concrete platform at my feet. I didn't make the slightest effort to pick it up. I suddenly realized I had stopped breathing and felt my stomach muscles tense up. I was becoming a coiled spring of rage, ready to uncoil. I could handle any one of them without a problem, but all of them at once would be difficult. At the moment, I didn't care. I started to move toward my tormentors when a huge hand grabbed my shoulder. Josh Hamilton, the dock foreman, looked me in the eye and simply nodded his head toward the main office. Nothing was said. I looked at the group with a hatred they had never seen before and followed Josh up the stairs. For some reason, they all stopped laughing and a concerned expression appeared on their faces. Josh walked into Henry Clark's office and I sat down across from Henry's secretary, Sally. Grady, would you like a cup of coffee? No, thanks. I'm too upset to hold a cup right now. Through the glass partition, I could see Josh and Henry talking. They seemed serious. Sally, were you at the party Saturday night? She just nodded in agreement. Can you tell me what the hell happened? I have no idea what's going on. Peggy hasn't said anything, and I don't know what to do. I don't have to say anything, Grady. That's something you should discuss with your wife. You were there, Sally. You saw what happened. Just give me a clue. Sally fiddled with some papers on her desk, trying to figure out how she could dodge talking to me. Please, Sally, I need to know. Peggy showed up at the party dressed to the hilt. After about an hour, Colin started pouring drinks into her. She seemed to be having a good time. Colin whispered something to his company every time he was refilled with a drink, and they all laughed. Finally, Peggy and Colin left for the back room. About 30 minutes later, Bob, Ray, and Freddy came back. We didn't see any of them for an hour, and then they reappeared, laughing and joking. Peggy was smiling, but she looked just awful. Her hair and dress were a mess. She and Colin left together about 10 minutes later. Thank you, Sally. I didn't want to hear that, but it explains everything. We sat in silence for about 10 more minutes. 
Josh came out and nodded for me to come in. Grady, I'm not thrilled with what happened this morning. Colin, Ray, Bob, and Freddy each got a week's vacation without pay. I want you to take two weeks vacation. Josh told me what happened on Saturday, and I assume this is the first you've heard of it. I can't afford to keep someone in the hospital. I don't believe this is your fault. But I expect you to get this sorted out before you get back. I'll do everything in my power to help you get through this. Just ask. Now get out of here. I nodded to Henry and thanked Sally again, walking out of the office. Colin and his guys were nowhere to be found as I walked towards the parking lot. I left my panties on the dock. I didn't go home. I drove north, looking for a safe haven where I could lose myself. I had plenty of time to think about the past and the present. Peggy and I went to high school together. She was large, fat, scruffy, and not at all what one would call attractive. She didn't know how to groom herself or put on makeup, her hair always looked like crap. She didn't belong to any hangouts and was basically a social outcast. Of course, that's what attracted me to her. I was six feet three inches tall and weighed about 300 pounds. I was large, but at the same time clumsy, shy, and unremarkable. I was too clumsy to play sports. Colin Farrell was the complete opposite. He was good looking, well spoken, and athletically built. I know it sounds silly, but there were rumors that girls tried to get Colin to ask them out so he could touch their cherries. He didn't have a steady girlfriend, but he was never without a date. I hated that guy. He bragged about his adventures, and the girls didn't seem to mind, all except Peggy. Peggy tried to get Colin to ask her out. She wanted to be able to say that she had had him first. Colin not only turned her down, but he told the whole school about it. He said that he only sleeps with girls, and he wasn't going to stoop so low as to screw a pig. The kids at school laughed it off, but Peggy was crushed. I saw it as a chance to move in with her. Since I had no idea how to woo a girl, I just started acting friendly. Pretty soon we became close, and by graduation we were a couple. I was the only one she was attracted to. After graduation, I got a job as a laborer at a construction site. After a few years, my fat disappeared, and I was all muscle and tendons, I was strong and coordinated. I was pleased to no longer be a walking joke. A year later, Peggy and I were married. Robert and Dave were born very close to each other, and Peggy started working out at a neighborhood gym shortly afterward. The transformation was amazing. Somewhere along the way, she learned how to fix her hair, apply just the right amount of makeup, and dress for going out. She looked good, and I was proud to have her as my wife. I loved her when she was a frog, and my reward was a princess. When I got the job on the loading dock, our whole lives changed for the better, right up until today. The A-14 highway turned into the A-1, and I continued to rack up the miles. I knew where I was going, and it was only a matter of time before I got there. I thought about my two sons. They came from a strong family, and they were showing it. We were making sure both were active so they wouldn't turn into lumps like us. Dave was two inches taller than Robert and a little slimmer. Robert had big arms and large hands. Both of them were in good physical shape and could take care of themselves. We taught them restraint and the importance of not being a bully. Both had the same goal of going to sea. I guess it was in the blood. I promised I would help them with anything they wanted to do. Peggy was a good mother and a great wife. She kept the house in order and didn't spend money on frivolous things. We had a great sex life, or so it seemed to me. We had fun when we had sex, and I was quite happy with that part of our lives. I found myself on the M6 highway, continuing to wind up the kilometers. The shadows were getting long, and I hoped to make it before dark. It was a seven-hour drive to Port Patrick, but it was the only place I wanted to be at the moment. I kept looking for the A75 highway, and finally found it at sunset. There were plenty of parking spaces outside the Duke's Duck at this time of year. I gave my keys to the barman and asked to rent a room for the week. I had no luggage, no change of clothes, and no razor, but I didn't care. He took the room key off the hook, gave it to me, and hung the car keys in the same place. I grabbed a pint of beer and sat down in the far corner. The streetlight filtered through the amber bottle glass in the window by my head. It was time to distract myself and forget about the world. I woke up late in my room in the mornings. I vaguely remembered how I got there. Usually one of the local regulars would help me up the stairs and lower me onto the bed. I never got under the sheets. I splashed water on my face and showered a couple times. 
I had to put the same clothes back on, so the shower didn't really help with the smell. I was growing a fierce beard. I never let my facial hair grow, and it was a little unnerving to see it in the state I was in. Every couple days, they would check my credit card to keep the account up to date. I'd been wallowing in self-pity for a while now, and I was starting to get sick of it. I was sitting there, staring glassily at the dartboard for the thousandth time, when two uniformed men walked in. I watched them without looking at them. They talked to the bartender for a bit, and the bartender nodded in my direction. He also pointed to my keys on the wall behind him. I assumed they were looking for me. I was amazed at my own cleverness. They didn't even try to talk to me. They just poured coffee into me for the next two hours. Grady, Grady Baxter, do you think you can talk to us? Did I do something wrong? We just need to talk. Are you ready? Can we go outside? The sun was shining, but everything around them was wet. The cobblestones in the street in front of the pub were slippery, and I took my time walking to the embankment. The whole street was going downhill, and I was still feeling a little groggy. The cool air filled my lungs. I don't smoke, but the air inside was so thick, the result was the same. I leaned against the granite seawall and threw up. It was mostly liquid because I hadn't eaten solid food for the past few days. My head began to clear, and so did my eyes. My companions waited patiently for me to come to my senses. I was beginning to feel obligated for giving them so much trouble. The bench I was sitting on was wet, but I didn't care. What can I do for you, gentlemen? First, we've been trying to find you since you've been missing for ten days. Secondly, we are trying to find Colin Farrell, and we're hoping you might be able to help us. Well, you found me, so that part of the problem is solved. I haven't seen Colin Farrell since the day I got here. I assume the bartender has already informed you that I haven't left the hotel since I checked in. I have no idea where Colin is, but I think I'll look for him when I get home. I chatted with them for another hour or so. They had nothing to charge me, and after they discovered I was safe, they seemed only interested in talking about Colin. They found me, thinking it was a credit card charge. I'll remember to not make that mistake again if it ever arises. I walked down the hill and bought fresh clothes and a toothbrush. I decided that I would keep the beard for a while, even though it looked like shit. After taking a shower, I paid the bill and headed home. On the way, I stopped about four times. Twice, I grabbed a bite to eat, but mostly I just tried to delay my arrival time. Nothing pleasant or joyful awaited me at home, but I wanted to see my boys. <coughs> she was sitting on the couch. There was only one light on in the living room. She looked at me with her hands folded in her lap, afraid to move. It looked like she was crying, but in the dim light, it was hard to be sure. I went to get a beer, but the thought of it made me a little queasy, so I got a Coke. I sat down in the chair across from her and waited to see what she had to say. The boys are staying the night at a friend's house. It was my idea, so we'd have time to talk alone. Why didn't you tell me about this before I found out? I don't know. I guess I was scared. Of what? I wasn't sure what you'd think or do. I did something stupid and it backfired on me. Backfired? What the hell is that? You're not going to be mad at me, are you, Grady? I don't know. It's probably best if you tell the truth, but we'll wait and see. Grady, do you remember what Colin did to me at school? Yes. Ever since it happened, I've wanted to get even with him for it. Saturday night at the party, I thought it was the right time, so I set a trap for him. That doesn't sound like the story I've heard. Listen to me, Grady. Like I said, things turned against me. I dressed really well and Colin started hitting on me. I let him know it was working and he suggested we go back to the pantry. We kissed for a while because I had to do it to set him up. After a while, he started playing with my breasts, but without my bra anymore. I took off my panties and waved them in front of his nose to seduce him. Why did you do that? What were you thinking? I wanted to get even with him. I wanted to make him pay for humiliating me. Anyway. I noticed a bulge in his pants and told him to take them off so we could enjoy ourselves. He dropped his pants and underwear, and then I did something girls should never do. Okay, what the hell did you do? I pointed at his junk and started laughing. I told him it was a pathetic semblance and that there was no way I was going to let some body with such a tiny weenie have me. As I teased him, his manhood began to diminish until there was nothing left but a limp rag. It was a disgusting act, 
but in this case, it's appropriate. Go on. I pulled myself together and opened the door to leave. Bob, Ray, and Freddy were waiting outside the door. Apparently, Colin had told them they could have a few seconds after they were done with me, and they waited patiently for their turn. I walked past them and, laughing, headed for the ladies' room. When I returned to the party, they were all standing around with wide smiles on their faces. Apparently, they had told all the other guys at the party that they had fucked me in the closet. They said it to get even with me for humiliating Colin. I got upset and left. I heard you left with Colin. That's not true. I left alone and went straight home. Did you leave your panties there for Colin? No, I just forgot them when I left. Why didn't you tell me? After they turned everything over, I got scared. I didn't know what to tell you. And you let me figure it out on my own in front of all my fellow officers. I felt like a fool, a cuckold. They were teasing me about what happened, and I couldn't even answer anything because I didn't know anything. I had to find out from the secretary what happened, and her story doesn't quite match yours. She wasn't there. I was. What I told you is what happened. Damn it, Grady. I'm your wife. You're supposed to stick up for me and support me. Peggy cried and went into the kitchen. I sat there with my Coke and watched her lean on the pottery table and cry quietly. I loved her more than anything in the world. She was the only girl I ever cared about. She fed me nonsense and made scandals. Peggy was anxious to save her marriage. Sally didn't have a single reason to lie to me. I had the urge to start questioning Peggy about every inconsistency in her story, but I decided not to. I couldn't change what had happened, and forcing Peggy to confess something she didn't want to would accomplish nothing. I really wanted to know the truth, but I wasn't going to get it from her. I decided to leave it at that and let her relax. I showered again and got into bed with my wife. She laid her head on my shoulder, whispered that she loved me, and we both fell asleep. I had a few more days before it was time to go back to work. The boys were happy to see me, but acted a little distant. I suggested a trip to London, which was quickly accepted. Peggy seemed pleased that the men in her family were getting closer. On the way to London, I learned that both boys had been suspended for fighting, a strict no-no in our family. Reluctantly, they explained that they had received a lot of admonishment about their mother's antics at the party and had finally decided to put a stop to it. Several boys with smart mouths ended up with wobbly teeth and black eyes. They hid from their mothers that they were suspended, but asked me for an explanation about the party. I put it off. We went to the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. I asked to bring three applications and the boys were delighted. It took an hour to fill out all the forms. I had all the necessary documents, including birth certificates and passports. After a short interview, we were each given medical forms to be filled out by a doctor. We had dinner at Wagamama and headed home. It was decided not to say anything to our mother or friends. The physical was finished the next day, and now all we had to do was wait. I had always loved Peggy. She was the only girl I had ever loved. She was the only girl I ever had sex with. In fact, she was the only girl I ever kissed. I found it hard to believe that she had done such a low act. I thought her act was disgusting and unforgivable. I was still willing to give her a chance if for some reason her story could be proven, but the odds were long. At the end of that week, she drove the final nail in her coffin. Peggy was very careful. She was careful never to mention the party or refer to anything related to it. She never discussed my trip to Port Patrick. She did her best to get our lives back on track.